Welcome to Leading Excellence. I'd like to welcome Brad, Chris, and Stephen, their time and uh, sharing their knowledge. There's a couple of things that we uh, can get away from today. First, it's an opportunity to learn, and it's an opportunity to celebrate. Um, Chris is, a, is an old teacher of mine way back when, a few decades ago, and Brad's a good mate, and I've just met Stephen, and I know they've put a lot of work into this, so I think this is a bit of a celebration as well, the success of the hard work and effort. Uh, who am I? My name's Andy Heckey. I'm the Technical Operations Manager at Matthews, and we've got a relationship with these guys uh, outside of the book. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to help support this book launch, and we're going to provide a little bit of a uh, taster, a case study about our journey at Matthews, uh, because we're practitioners. We're going to hear from experts, uh, but you know, what do we want to know from the experts is from the practitioner's point of view, because we need to deploy this stuff. So our timeline today might be a little quicker uh, with uh, things like the Q&A. There'll be more time for coffee, which is, which is great. Um, so I'll provide a little bit of a case study insight, the role of leadership specifically, so we can tie that in with the content of what Brad, Chris, and Stephen will share. Interactive, a bit of a Q&A, and as we said, uh, the book signing and, and the biscuits and things. So, uh, Matthews, Australasia, 40 plus year family business, uh, successful business uh, in the auto identification space. Uh, that may or may not mean something uh, to, to you guys. Um, I guess the challenge of a 40 year business is the growth and uh, the things that come along with that. So, every business that's a major global started as a little business at some point in its beginning. And it chases success. That success brings growth. That growth brings scale. And the scale obsoletes our methods, our processes, and even our thinking and leadership. And that's the cycle that we put ourselves on. That's forced evolution. And Matthews is very much uh, in, in that cycle where 40 years we're starting to grow. And what we're learning is that 10, 15% growth is a bigger number as you get bigger. So the volume footprint becomes bigger. And this really puts a real challenge on the leadership. And this is why I'm excited to hear what these three gentlemen are going to share with us. So really, uh, it's got us thinking what's gotten us here will not get us to where we want to go. So we need to adapt. So where to from here? So this is the Shingo model. I'm a student of Shingo, thanks to Chris, uh, from way back when. I've really embraced this. One of the learnings I've had over the time is that this model applies to entities. An individual, a corporation, uh, a unit, government, public service, because the anatomy is there. And really, we're focusing on the middle part, the culture, but more importantly, that ideal culture that drives the systems and the use of the tools to get us the results. And really, this is the challenge for us at Matthews, because our culture has been informal, small business, and we're now moving into systemization and scalability. It requires a complete rethink of the people and primarily the leaders to take us on that journey. So we need to operate different, lead different, more importantly, we need to behave differently. Uh, about 10 years ago, uh, our CEO, Mark Dingley, started to recognize this and made what I felt to be the most important decision, uh, in my humble opinion, he offered me a job. Uh, at which point, I came along with my briefcase and the Shingo model. Uh, I'm head of operations uh, at Matthews, which is all of our customer-facing type uh, operations. Uh, and we've started to setting up beachheads. And like most of you practitioners, we've had some successes. We've had our fair share of failures, which provide great learnings. Uh, but also, we've also made a cultural footprint. We've established a beachhead. And what that then has led to two or three years ago is Mark has said, okay, now's the time. He understands that it starts with the CEO, right? We cannot achieve a corporate change unless it starts at the top. And so he has then challenged the senior leadership team. He said, we will go first. And the first thing we took care of is our Matthews way, our guiding principles, if you will. This is what is going to inform the culture that we want, not necessarily the culture we have. And that's a very important point about adaptive leadership. It's where we want to go. Um, I guess as, as part of that, I'm hoping this is 
uh, familiar to you all as practitioners that you're wrestling with the same challenges as, as everybody else. If we then talk about the world of the practitioner, if we say the shingle model is really the anatomy, the structure that we have, we have the systems and tools, but really it's the people and how they operate that which determines the results. Again, leading more and more into understanding why adaptive leadership leading excellence is such an important skill. So the practitioner's challenge is building that ideal culture. You've got a culture. Is it the right culture, though? And this is why that guiding principle set is so important. And this is, again, from my uh, learnings way back when uh, with Chris. Uh, we have our Matthews way, our purpose, the thing that defines us as a community. We have our people. The important thing is that we engage the people with the purpose. Now, this is very important. It starts with recruiting. Right? If we don't select the right people with the right core values that match our community's core values, we're going to have some challenges right from the word go. But this is really where the leader's storytelling and whatnot is so important. Once we've got uh, an engaged team, we can then start looking at what we do and how we do it. And we can start to look for improvements. Now, the important thing to remember here is we can whip up a lot of enthusiasm and activity fixing things. The question is, are we fixing things that matter or are we just fixing things for the sake of fixing things and we feel good about it? So we got to make sure our processes align with our purpose, but more importantly, that value for the customer. For a commercial entity, that's where they decide they're going to pay the invoice and give us the lifeblood to continue on this journey. For a hospital, it's about did we deliver the great care uh, to our patients. And so as a practitioner, this is what we're doing to try to build the ideal culture. And this is what our leaders are now trying to learn. And we've also adapted into the scrum at scrum at scale to give us that cadence, that weekly running the shop, doing the transactional work, running the plan. What did we do this week to advance our future? And what did we do to develop our people this week? Because we're growing. If we do this well, if we pick up the pace and people start doing what they need to do because they know it and they choose to do it, not because some manager or supervisor told them to do it. And this is where the momentum and the magic starts to happen. And this is the goal of every practitioner. Adaptive leadership, for me, I'm suggesting it's the most important skill set of any leader. You know, we're constantly in this rotation of what and why, how we're going to do that, ensuring our people have the ability to do that. Uh, tools, skills, uh, freedoms, etc. Uh, then they can make the choice and they will determine whether they can or can't or will or won't. And then as a leader, we then need to deal with that to ensure the, the team. And so as we're spinning that flywheel, if we uh, reference our friend Jim Collins, about good to great, you know, this is a perpetual journey. It never ends. Uh, we're doing that. But the world is fighting against us succeeding, probably not deliberately, but we've got all of those things at the bottom, you know, the law of entropy. Things just deteriorate over time unless we put energy into them. You know, you wash the car, by golly, next weekend is dirty again, so you got to wash the car again, right? And this is what we're constantly fighting with. VUCA, the stuff that happens, luck, it's just stuff. You know, someone comes along and parks another boat in the middle of the Suez Canal sideways, you know, and disrupts supply chain. You know, uh, a country invades another. We have a rainstorm. We had winds. These are the things that just get in our way that leaders have to adapt to. And it happens instantly. Yesterday, Louise was a top employee. Today, she comes in. She's out of sorts. The cat died or she has some other challenge. We don't know. We now need to recognize and adapt to this as the leader because the world is just changing hour by hour, and that's the game. You just got to constantly be in there. So to wrap things up and start to hand it over to the experts, I opened up this book for the first time, and I dropped it on my desk. And lo and behold, like the sun parting, it opened up on page 77, and I saw this quote. And I just thought this was meant to be. So I've pasted it in here. Talk is cheap. Actions are what makes the leadership and how you make your people feel. You're trying to get that pack running. Uh, you know, I talk about the, the dog sled and, and the pack of well-coordinated, uh, beautiful animals that work together to produce a result. And I closed the book. I said, I don't need to read it now. I got that quote. <laughs> but it reminded me of my favorite quote uh, that I bring to the table uh, often. 
And this is about leadership is the thing that produces results beyond what the science of management tells us is actually possible. We've all seen it. We all want to do enterprise excellence. We all want that because we see those magnificent results. Management is a part of that. But it's the leadership that actually makes that happen. And this is why I'm excited now to ask Brad to uh, come up and share with us the first part of their uh, leading excellence uh, guide to how to be successful, I guess. Thank you, sir. So everyone, while Chris brings that over, I just want to set the scene with where the essence of the book came from. Is that Steve and Chris and I got together and we were talking about, you know, you talk about the basis of a continuous improvement culture and all the stuff we know about that. And we, we sort of said, well, so much of it just comes back to leadership, right? And what we do or don't do in leadership. And then we also were talking about that we want to write a book that we want to write a book that's actually enjoyable. You know, so many books in our game are technical and a hard read. And so we sort of set ourselves this vision to write a book that truly talks about the part that leadership plays, which is massive, but also how can we write it in a way that's actually enjoyable and a great read. And so you will be the critics of this. What we're doing is we've got the book launch happening. I'm going to take the first part of the book and then I'm going to hand over to Stephen and then on to Chris. So if you look at it, what, what we did is we yeah. were exploring, and all of us, the three of us between us, about 100 years of experience working with organisations, and we were just talking about where we see greatness and where we don't, and employee engagement is a massive contributor to it. Like Where you get organisations where employees are highly engaged, but not highly engaged in a happiness bubble, right? You could have amazing engagement scores, but it's purely because we're in a bubble of happiness, right? We're talking about engagement with morale. We're driven and engaged. It's, it's different. You get companies at the moment where only 23% of the world's workforce is engaged by way of Gallup when you look at the surveys. And Steve and Chris and I were talking about, well, what is it that leadership do that really creates high-performance culture? And we're like, okay, well, it's really about their behaviour. And you've heard Andy talk about that. But we're also going, look, we believe that it's also the organisations and the leadership that can connect people to meaningful goals, connect people to purpose, connect, help people define aspirational, meaningful goals and kick forward. And so and behold, Gallup, with their recent surveys, came up with exactly the same thing. They said, well, it's all about leadership, behaviour, primary number one, and number two is do I have a meaningful goal? And so you go, well, that's the essence of it, right? Leadership behaviour, and then it's also about am I connected to a meaningful goal? And then part of that, when you look at it, you go, every person's different, right? So when you think about it, every person in the workplace has a different background, different history, different genetics, different learned experience. So we're like, okay, as, as leaders, if we put it into a nutshell, what is it that the great leaders are doing? And we define, well, they're actually serving the growth of people rather than their own ego. Okay, so if you put it into a real nutshell, we said that the great leaders are focused heavily on serving the growth of the other people around them. And they really fight that natural desire we got, which is to serve our own emotions. That's like a primary driver. So we call it leaders who serve. And this is not new. The, particularly the world of agile has really got onto this piece that to have really strong autonomous teams and high performance, you've got to have leaders who serve. But when you think about it, I've got to serve the growth of others. What you need to be able to do is adapt because every person's different. So we're going to talk a bit about this adaptive leaders throughout the rest of this presentation. But I just want to share with you that when it comes to being a leader and being one that adapts, your behavior is what counts. Okay, so ultimately it comes back to our behavior because that's what the other person experiences is our behavior. But we know that there's a deeper position to that, right? Because our behavior is driven largely by what happens in our conscious and subconscious brain. You go, what drives our behavior, right? Now, a lot of the time when you're anxious and you're busy and you're flat out and there's a lot going on or emotional, we know that we don't think we can just do, 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 do. And so to be a great leader, we're like, okay, well, it's about ideal behaviours and how people experience those, but there's this whole mind part and this emotion part that plays a big part of it. So we collaborated with a neuroscientist in Australia, Dr. Mark Williams, 
who really helped us define this model, and we'll take you through it now. So to be an adaptive leader, what we're saying is that your emotions, if you're not careful, will just drive your behavior and you won't consciously think. Ultimately, to be an adaptive leader, we came up with the core belief system that we need to be able to control our thoughts and pause and think and then choose the ideal behavior. But at the heart of it, a big driver of our emotions is our core purpose and core values as a human. So Dr. Mark Williams and Laurie Skander helped us develop this model that as leaders, if we can help leaders understand their core purpose and how this connects to the organization and their people and understand their core values, we can help leaders stay in a place of emotional control, stay conscious, be adaptive. Whereas if we don't understand this as leaders, what we can find is that our emotions can get the better of us and it's hard to be adaptive and actually move forward. So it's funny, you know, we're in a game of continuous improvement. A lot of us are CI practitioners, but it actually comes back to like psychology, a position of psychology that we need to really sink into to truly enhance our leadership. And we we're very lucky to be connected with Dr. Mark Williams and Laura Skander. So when you, as a leader, we, we understand and we can help leaders build their ability to understand who they are and how that connects to the company, we can help them understand to stay in thought and really choose ideal behaviors. And like Andy mentioned, if you've defined those, it can help because at least you know the ideal behaviors like Matthews have done that you're trying to lean into. You can then be adaptive. So the key position of being adaptive, and Ken Blanchard did a lot on this many years ago on situational leadership, is we gotta look at the person, consider the context surrounding them, and then pause, think, and choose our behavior to respond. So this is at the heart of the book that we've written about is building leadership capability to understand the person that's engaging them, consider the context surrounding them, pause, think, and then respond with the right behavior. But when you go, what are the right behaviors? So the three of us really worked hard on looking at the ideal leadership behaviors we've seen over the years that leaders can really practice and get better at to truly create great outcomes. And we define the five hats to the adaptive leader. And this is where the essence of the book comes in. That if leaders can understand themselves, understand their organization and the ideal behaviors, stay conscious through managing their emotions and really staying in thought. And then the hats are, we've got, is basically the first, I'm just gonna start with the teach hat. As leaders, we're teachers. How can we build our capability to actually teach and grow the people around us? Now, teaching is only part of the gig, right? Everyone knows that you're going to learn part of your learning in the classroom. We then write, well, the other hat that a leader could use in any situation is the ability to then support a person, support someone with their learning journey, support them and recognize them for great teamwork, recognize them for living our culture, or even support them in a, in a state of emotion. Our ability to show empathy, our ability to really use active listening and paraphrasing. So a lot of books have been written on these different aspects. But the other hat we just we just came up with is a coach hat. The ability to actually ask great questions and get people to think. We all know there's been a lot written on coaching, but we believe it's not the only hat. You know, you can read one book and it sort of makes you feel like you just got to become a great coach. We actually believe there's more to it than just that. And we do talk about different coaching models and different ways that you can coach. The other hat, we feel it's probably not used a lot now is being directive if people are breaking culture. If you've defined culture as a team and you know those ideal behaviors and someone is breaking it, if you do not directly deal with it, well, you're gonna impact your culture. But I think you'll, you'll all probably be able to think of leaders around industry right now where they avoid crucial conversations. Like that is part of culture now in organizations. But if you're not, if we're not skilled at wearing that hat, we can avoid conversations that can actually impact our culture. And the final hat we talk about, which is very important, and I'm gonna hand over to Stephen in a moment on this, is the Inspire hat. Our ability to understand the organization's purpose and where it's going, and being able to understand an individual's core belief system, that individual's core purpose and core values, who they are, which I pose these conversations aren't happening much in an organization, or many organizations right now, how do we help someone understand their drivers and connect it to the organizations? But also, too, part of the inspiration hat is then being able to wear these, the right hats at the right moment. 
So the reason we termed them hats, and I think I'll, hand out, I'll talk to Stephen on this, is that in one engagement with an employee, you might need to wear multiple hats. It could be someone engages you in an emotional state and you need to wear the support hat. And then the person in the context is the piece they're emotional about, they don't really understand. So they calm down and I might need to put on the teach hat. So in the one engagement with someone, there could be multiple hats we need to wear. But the effectiveness with which we do that and the way that we pause and truly think and then respond in a way with the right behaviour will play a big part on what we achieve or don't achieve. So there's a position on that Inspire hat that is really quite critical too, which is basically when we engage people, is our behaviour filling their bucket of inspiration or is it emptying it? And on this point, I'm going to hand over to Stephen to actually chat more to you about the whole human factor of inspiration and engagement. Yeah, thanks, Brad. Um, so just a bit of background. So 30 years uh, experience in pretty much uh, leadership. I got to meet Chris Chris back in 2013, I think it was, Chris. And Chris has been, a bit like Andy, has been my uh, mentor. Um, and he... I, it was almost like a step change in career because I was, I was, you know, up to then I was leading sales teams, lots of large sales teams, transforming the cultures. But then it was 2013, I kind of got introduced to Chris and found my own personal purpose, which was how do I um, impact the lives of, of many people by seeing the true potential in everybody. But over my career, I've, I've managed and led a lot of, you know, large sales teams and gone in to transform cultures. But learned along the way that there was a fundamental component um, formula that we started to, I started to evolve over time. I'm going to talk to you a bit about this, this formula uh, for high performance. Um, one that I've used and tested over many years. And it's character plus behaviors plus vulnerability minus interference. And I'll go through each one of these in, in a bit of detail. Andy talked about a bit about engaging employees uh, earlier on to connect them to the purpose. Where the character came in was when I was asked by the CEO of um, Commonwealth Bank to go in and transform one of their contact centers. I went in and I looked at, well, hang on a second, the leaders are spending an exorbitant amount of time on the system of people managing, right? They are managing poor behaviors. So why was that? So let's get into a bit of root cause analysis. We did a lot of workshops. We did identify why are our leaders, some leaders were spending up to 65% of their week managing performance, managing poor performance or poor behaviors. And we realized that we were actually recruiting on technical ability, right? Our leaders were trying to fill, excuse the term, but a bum on seat just to fulfill the term, get people, get, get people answering the phones as quickly as possible. So we, we, we did a pivot. We did a, a big rethink of what does our onboarding strategy look like? Our technical ability, we stopped. I said, I don't want people with technical ability. All right, because you can you can teach people the technical side. You can wear that teach hat and teach them the technical side. I want people in this organization with strong character. And this links back to the great book by James Kerr, Legacy. I don't know if you've ever heard of Legacy or read the book, but it's one of my favorite books of all time. And he talks about character being one of the main principles of the New Zealand All Blacks and why they were so, so, so successful over time. And their rule comes in there, excuse the term as well, the no dickhead rule. Right? They want people, and Sydney Swans, I think, have the same principle. They want good people on their team. So I said that to the leadership team at the time. We want good people with strong character on the team. We don't want people with white anting who are going to be passive aggressive. We want really strong people with strong character to come into our team. So we changed our whole onboarding system to recruit on character and behaviors. All right? So our whole recruitment strategy completely changed. What do you think happened? Over time, when we started to manage out the poor performance, we got people in with strong character, connected to a North Star, connected to a purpose, that were driving continuous improvement, that were there to back each other, and we started to see a fundamental shift in performance. I won't go into the performance details, but it was a remarkable shift in performance. Behavior side, I'm not going to talk about, because we all, I think Andy mentioned ideal behaviors, and you know, ideal behaviors drive ideal results, um, and we want people with ideal behaviors in our organization. The vulnerability piece came when I was tasked. Um, I was part of the uh, transformation that was looking at one of Commonwealth Bank's operating model 
changing it from a functional command and control architecture of an organization to more of a agile kind of tribes, platforms, and customer value proposition. I remember one of my mentors, my executive coaches at the time, used, he said to me, and he always used to say to me, he says, Dargs, my nickname Dargs, never ever take a role from money or title. Go to where you're most alive at work and tingling, and what if you could replicate that many times over? Go to where you're most alive at work and tingling, and what if you could replicate that many times over? Unfortunately, I didn't listen to him. What he was meaning was go to where your purpose is. Forget about money, forget about title. Your purpose will lead you there. But again, uh, probably one of the greatest failures I cherish most, I didn't listen to him. So I saw that general manager title of Commonwealth Bank Group, and I wanted to be you know, that person. So I took a role uh, off the back of that transformation. That role was general manager of sustainable change. So I was I was the tr the tribe as such in between the distribution uh, divisions and and all the tribes producing you know agile faster change. I was like the goalkeeper of all this huge velocity of change that was coming onto the organization, trying to protect the front line from how do you, how do you balance that level of that capacity and demand to absorb the change and make make sure that. They're absorbing it in, in a succinct way. A uh, nightmare of a job. Absolute, because I had all these distribution GMs that were I was trying to keep happy, but then all the tribes GMs who are KPI'd on just delivering more change and effective change out fast. So I was like trying to balance all these different personalities. That I didn't know it, but I was deep down I was going into a spiral of uncontrol that I didn't know myself I was going through. And um it wasn't until I was like I was I was coming home from work at night. Um, I was falling asleep at the drop of a hat. My wife was talking to me. It was just like white noise. Sometimes that still happens. <laughs> uh, she's a wonderful lady. Um, but worse, worse, worse than that was my kids were talking to me. My kids were, you know, a lot younger then, but I wasn't even listening to them. I was like, Dad, you're not listening to me. And I'd fall asleep. But I used to do the gym. Every, I still do every morning at five o'clock, quarter past five. I was dragging myself out of bed every morning. Literally lethargic, could not get myself. But when I came into work, as soon as I entered those doors, I had my game face on. I was, but deep down, I was struggling. And it really was, it was one day on a Sunday. I remember it so well. It was a beautiful Perth, um, sunny morning. A friend of mine invited me to play Cottesloe Golf Club. And I live in North Perth. So I was driving to Cottesloe, which was along the Indian Ocean, right? And if, if, if you've been in Perth, you'll, you know, the, you can picture the scene. I was driving past Scarborough, and I could see this beautiful Indian Ocean. And I had this overwhelming urge to drive into that ocean. And I just I had that feeling came over me, going, "I want this. This I cannot cope anymore. This is actually driving me into uh, somewhere that I just could not feel. I, I, I could not just put one foot in front of the other." I managed to drive to Cottesloe Golf Club, and I I pulled up the car, I rang my wife, um, and I just bawled out crying, going, "I." I just had this overwhelming feeling I wanted to end it all. She talk, talked me off that perch. It took me a while to, to, to calm me down. Uh, and we agreed a plan. The plan was I'd go out and play golf. And that evening, we would sit down and we'd, we'd come up with a plan of how, how we're going to tackle it. My wife should be a psychologist and a psychiatric, <laughs> certainly to deal with me anyway. Um, but... We, we met that evening, and, and the next day, Monday and Tuesday, was executive meetings. So the CEO and, and, and the gen rest of the general managers were, were meeting at their normal two-day event, um, which most, you know, you know yourself, these, these executive meetings take months of uh, agendas, uh, items. But the first part of the agenda is the usual, you know, well-being check, and went around and got to my turn, and I just put up my hand and said, guys, I'm team, I'm drowning. And I explained the story. What happened next was, was remarkable, because I thought and felt that, I was isolated because, you know, the feeling of the higher up the organization you get, you know, the lonelier it can get. The meeting agenda was paused uh, and the CEO and all the rest of GMs went into problem solving mode. Um, you know, how do we help and solve problems for, for, for dogs? And we broke it down. We spent the next two hours just problem solving. We agreed a plan. Uh, one of those plans plan was a tri tripod, which was myself and two other GMs would meet every two weeks. Uh, and, and that was just a venting session to create that safe psychological place for because when I started to speak up other GM said well actually I'm feeling that same way so it all, almost create, created a real psychological safe space for that executive team to actually you know show up and be their true vulnerable selves um, but what happened then after that was when I was asked to take over the their, their contact centers 
I told this story in front of you know 400 odd colleagues, um, people, um, frontline people. And it was almost like a game of two halves. It was almost like they, they connected. I was a human being. I, I was that vulnerable person. I had a heart. And it's almost like their performance then lifted. They came to work each day, not because I asked them to come to work each day. They stayed later or they worked harder, not because I asked them to work harder, because they felt connected. Creating that constant purpose, that inspiring vision as well, to, you know, because they had no aspiring, they had no aspirations of where they wanted to go. So we created a big you know, audacious goal of being global best in class contact center. And that which, which obviously when we looked at the character and behaviors as well, how do we create really strong development systems to develop our people through through that organization? And we ended up getting global best in class in three years, given Chris saw the results, remarkable results, just by that pure moment of showing vulnerability as a leader, creating a safe place for people to speak up and come to work each day to be their true authentic selves. The interference piece came during my time actually running those contact centers in Sydney and Perth, when um, there was a young girl called Jess, for the purpose of the book, we call her Jess, but Jess's performance was 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 pretty pretty good. It was just tipping along, always meeting expectations, behaviors was excellent. But all of a sudden, Jess's, Jess's performance dropped off the floor. Like, we couldn't, we couldn't understand why for a period of six or seven months. And it was normally in a command and control architecture of an organization, you would, you know, your leaders would go in and put them on a performance improvement plan, right? And how do you lift their performance? But I coached my, my senior leaders at the time. Uh, Seamus was the, was the leader I coached on, on, on interference. Everybody in, your, in this world, right, has two forms of interference, either one of two forms of interference, right? Either intrinsic or extrinsic interference. Right. If I say to you, what's intrinsic interference? What, 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 what would that be? Throw it out to the group. Within yourself. Within yourself, yeah. yeah. Emotional what? state. Emotional state, yeah. Anxiety, depression, lack of self-confidence, afraid to speak up. All those things that people come to work each day to grapple with. All right. What about external or extrinsic interference? Go on, have a guess. Operational day-to-day stresses from your workplace. Yeah, bang on, right? Or, yeah, workplace bullying, uh, domestic abuse, uh, domestic violence, financial abuse, you know, large mortgages that go on, people stress outside of work. Yet we as leaders go and put them on a performance improvement plan without truly understanding the extrinsic or intrinsic interference that that person is going through. Lots of, lots of interferences, and especially in today's world of VUCA, it's, it's even getting harder. You've got social media. You've got people coming into your organization. The biggest learning for me when I looked after the contact center is one on our onboarding. I assumed that they knew how to do emails, right? You're looking at a generation now. I'm far beyond. I don't even know what gen we're on now. Gen, I don't know this. I'm gone beyond that. Like we were recruiting people in that were used to doing Snapchats and texts and stuff like that. So they'd never used Outlook before. So how do we adapt as a leader to understand the current market? So Jess, Jess, anyway, I coached uh, Seamus to, to, to go and understand what, what's going on in Jess's world. Try and get Jess to be okay to speak up. Took Seamus a while. Took, took him a, a good few weeks to get Jess. Took her out for coffees. Eventually, Jess opened up, um, and Jess was going through a change to be Theo. And massive, massive interference, right? So we went into, okay, support mode. Support hat on, like, team, let's get around. Not only for Jess, but also Jess's team, or Theo's team, I should say. How do we, how do we support the team around Theo so that they understand what to say, what not to say, how to act, how to, inter- how to interact? You know, what toilets do they use? What can they say? What can't they say? So we engaged external consultants in to help us with that journey time of the organization was going through a, a diversity strategy as well and they put in a um, non-binary toilet which really helped with the whole change management of it but all of a sudden then Jess's performance or Theo's performance went through the roof like and I mean performed at a really high level beyond where we even dreamed of getting to and when I left the contact centers back in 2000 I think it was 21 Theo came to me in the in the kitchen and the usual cake and the big face of dargs on the cake <laughs> Looked terrible, but anyway, gave me a big hug and started breaking down, just broke down crying, saying they've never, ever felt so supported. So what was going on in Theo's life at the time, they had inter- in, he had intrinsic and extrinsic. The intrinsic was the going through the change. 
But what we didn't know at the time, which didn't didn't uh, it told me in the kitchen was he was also going through extrinsic. Family disowned him, friends disowned him, kicked out of his house, lots of things going on. And work and the leadership team around supported Theo through that journey. Okay? So that's where the interference, and that goes to the true essence. The formula here goes to the true essence of respecting every individual in the Shingo principle. And we need to think and act, train and coach our leaders on how do we actually truly understand every individual. Pause, reflect what's going on in the environment. It could be workplace pressures. We've got a leader putting on production pressures over safety concerns. What's going on in the environment before we, act, we actually act as a leader? And what hat do we need to wear? Yeah, cool. I'm going to now hand over to Chris. Thanks, man. Leave, leave that one up for me, please. Yep. Thank you. Excellent. So, um, what, what we try to do with the book is to not do a theoretical book, but to do a book based on practical experiences. So, there's over 30 case studies in the book. That What Dag's just shared is one of those amazing stories in the book. And we've then tried to relate them back to help us to learn. And I think what, what came across from both dogs and, and Brad then is about the importance of understanding ourselves from an emotional point of view, because how we better understand ourselves has a big impact on how we interact with others. So the first three chapters of the book are all about what's my purpose, what's my values. There's some really nice, straightforward exercise in there, which every time all of us have just run those exercises recently, and every time we've done it, people have gone, wow, that helps a lot. So we re I recommend having to think about that. And you see, essentially, as people, we are first and foremost feeling beings who have the ability to think. But the way our brains work is that our initial reaction to any situation or conversation is emotional. And we jump straight through that emotional response unless we've trained ourselves and think about it in a different way to be able to engage the higher cognitive abilities of our brain. So what we one of the thinking behind this is that um, we need to build the habit of being able to pause in any conversation that we can then respond in the appropriate way. As Dark says, you can respond in one way emotionally. We might have gone a different way for our response emotionally to Jess or Theo would have been very different than the response of pausing and thinking about what's the appropriate hat to wear in this context. So if we're going to do that, we need to think about also how do we allocate our time as leaders. And whenever I'm talking to leaders about improvement, and you know, oh, very often the first thing they say is, how am I supposed to find time to do that? <laughs> I'm too busy. Have you seen my calendar and how many meetings I'm attending? There's no way you're going to be able to pause. Just need people to get on with stuff. So we calm down. So, okay. Let's think about what are you busy on? Okay. And um, it's partly, and I did this myself many years ago, busy on the wrong things. Right? So we did... Um, Myself and Peter Hines did a book a few years ago called The Essence of Excellence. And part of that, we researched lots of prize-winning organizations around the world. And we looked at how leaders spend their time in those, other, in those organizations. And uh, it is 60 to 70% working on culture. A big chunk of time working on improvement and a small amount of time working on the day job. When I did the analysis for myself and when I get leaders to sit down and do the analysis of how we allocate, how they're allocating the time, it's often the opposite way around. So most of the time is on the day job, day-to-day -day stuff. And what I mean by that is I actually probably doing my people's job rather than my own. I'm fixing everything for everybody. People are coming to me and I am being the helpful leader and giving them the answers or telling them what to do. That makes me feel good triggers the endorphins in my brain that encourage me to do more of the same thing. It's exactly the wrong thing to do. What I'm actually doing is limiting their ability to think for themselves and taking more and more on my shoulders. So this is where the hats, the coaching hat and the support hats come in in terms of what we're saying is, no, no, you've got to be, uh, you build people by asking questions, by getting them to think for themselves and you start by doing that, you're working on culture. 
And this might sound like, oh, you know, I can see people sitting there whenever I talk. They go, oh, where on earth does this time come from? And it's not necessarily about doing loads of extra things that you don't do now. It's about changing the focus of the things that you do now. So, for example, when you're in a leadership team meeting, how much of that leadership team agenda is dedicated to people and culture? Yeah. And often it might be, I've seen, I saw one recently, it was the last item on the agenda and often get talked about because we ran out of time to talk about everything else. Yeah. But if we make it the first item on the agenda and we say 50%, our role as leaders is to manage culture, why isn't 50% plus of our meeting about the people and what we're doing to manage culture? Then you start changing how much time you're spending on culture. When you go and have conversations with people, when you do look, listen and learn walks, which you talk a lot about in the book, you're working on the culture. You're changing the way you spend your time. You might already do a walk now, go and visit the shop for an hour, but what kind of conversations do you have? Do you ask people how they're doing on the scores or do you ask people how they're feeling and how they're connecting to the business? takes you the same amount of time, but you get a very different result depending on what kind of conversation you have. Because for most people, what's important to their boss is important to them. So if all you're doing is asking about the numbers, that's what's important. If you're asking about behaviors, that's what's important. Okay. So Brad mentioned this thing about leaders who serve. So who do leaders serve? Well, the very first question to ask yourself is, am I serving myself or am I serving my people? And I should be serving my people so that they can serve the customer. It's not just a nice thing to do. It actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, Frontline employees have more impact on the customer experience than we possibly can do because there's usually a lot more of them. So we serve them to serve the customer. We make sure that they have the skills and the tools and the culture needed to make a great customer experience. Our customers experience the culture that we have internally. So if we really want our customers to have a great experience, we need to have a great internal culture experience for our people. The two go hand in hand. So we can develop this by being really clear on behaviors, by changing our attitude about what we think a leader is. A leader is someone who enables people, who sees the potential in people and helps them to grow. But that's not enough on its own. We can put all that in place and it won't work unless we also make sure that our systems support that. Because our systems will drive behavior. So if we aren't clear on the purpose and the, of the system, we'll get, we can put all the great behaviors we like in place, they'll just get washed away. They won't, they won't stick unless this, we design in our systems to support them. So we will be really clear on what is our purpose for this system, whatever system that is. What behaviors do we need to deliver this purpose? And then, how might we measure it with key behavioral indicators so that we shift from driving our business focus purely on KPIs to thinking about key behavioral indicators. How are we measuring the culture and the behaviors? You can't see culture, you can't manage culture, but you can see and measure behaviors. So how are we doing that to support the organization? And then when we do that, when we design systems, we get ideal results that way. Why this is important is, you know, we can spend a long, long time defining behaviors. And then we miss the fact that the systems will drive a completely different behavior. So the two things need to come together. I'll give you an example. I visited a logistics company and uh, they'd introduced a, a, a new system of uh, reward and reckon, reward for drivers. Right? They said, we need to save some money. Uh, we can do that by reducing our fuel bills and it'd be good for the environment. So we're going to pay our drivers a bonus if they use less fuel. Sounds good. Yeah. So a few weeks later, they said, this is, they called me and said, Chris, we've got a disaster here. We need some help. I said, what's the matter? I said, well, uh, the easiest way to save some fuel is if you drive slower. Yeah. So all the drivers are going slower and now all our customers are getting late deliveries and we're getting fined and penalties for late deliveries. Oh, dear, that's not good. I said, no, no. I said, that's, that's only the start of it. 
It's a, the other really great way that you can get lower fuel is if you come back to the depot with an empty truck. So that all our drivers now are forgetting to bring, forgetting to bring back the, the backload on the truck. So all the trucks are coming back really light, and the drivers get an amazing bonus for driving empty trucks. And he says, the final straw came last week when I had to stop a fight because one driver caught his mate siphoning off fuel from his truck. <laughs> so so we, we really have to think about what's the behavior that we want and then design the system to support that behavior, uh, which will give us the ideal result. And we keep going through that again, cycle again and again. Um, but uh, how often, I know in my career, many times, I just designed a system without thinking about behaviors. And we do that all the time, the two things at each point. So what we want to get to is this situation where instead of our people being constrained by our systems, they're overburdened with bureaucracy, because what we tend to do when things go wrong is just put more and more control in, which makes it more disengaging for people and more constrained, so they stop, think, we force them to stop thinking for themselves. Instead, what we do is need to design our systems so that they have freedom. There's still a framework though, I'm not advocating anarchy, but there's a framework that gets wider and wider, which allows people to be able to contribute and make decisions for themselves, because we've agreed how people need to behave, we've agreed what the purpose is, well, let them get on with it. Let them connect to the business and empower them to make it a great place to work and make great decisions. We don't need to tell them exactly what to do in every situation. That's how we start creating fantastic places to work. So the first part of the book goes through how to create your, your, you know, your purpose and understand your core belief system. Then we talk about the formula uh, and then we talk about how, how systems support the formula and the behaviors and throughout the book, it's all peppered with case studies that bring those things to life. And what we do at the last chapter, we, we give the opportunity for a bit of reflection and say, okay, well, so what? So we've got uh, two assessments in the book that are self-assessments. One is around, uh, well, okay, where am I today in terms of these hats? Um, you know, do I need to get this hat? Yeah, I'm going to go and buy this hat, or actually I'm real practiced at this hat. And it's just self-assessment. And, and then we also have against the key 10 chapters in the book, a kind of a, a maturity grid, which you can then say, okay, where am I today? And where do I want to, want to be? So we thought it might be a bit of a fun way to end this session, just to get you to think about the hats. I know we've only given you a, like a token introduction to them. Um, but if you've got your phone with you, please get it out now. Um, you are not normally get asked to get your phone. Please don't go on your emails, but um, I'm gonna show you something. Uh, just you to have a go at and have some fun with it. And say, well, you know, you can you should also, if I've set it up right, be able to fill in more than one if you want to, but don't feel you have to. But which hats would you like to work on? I just wanted to get a feel for from the audience, you know, is the is the one that's standing out or is it we'd we'd be really curious to know which hats you connect with. X, that's really, really great. So actually, we, we, we want to be better at inspiring. How do we inspire? We want to be uh, interesting that directors come up, yeah? Uh, it's the hat that we think we need to use least out of any of the hats. But it actually is one that many, many people are reluctant to use. And it is really critical. One way we talk about it in the book is, is that actually leaders, uh, I like to think as leaders of gardeners, if anyone does any gardening in the room, but you cannot, you cannot uh, create a garden and then leave it. It just goes to weeds straight away, you know, within weeks. And building culture is the same. You have to, it takes years and years to build that culture and behavior, but you have to manage it every second of every day. You have to deal, with, and the link to the direct hat is you have to deal with the weeds. You have to say, call out when there's something that's not as it should be and do it very quickly. Because as soon as you let it fester, it takes over and destroys everything else you've built. So one that you need, that you need to wear, but you know, in, not that often, hopefully, but you do need to do it when it's required. So, um, and 
we're gonna, I'm going to try and save some of these jokes because I think from all our sessions, we're really interested to see how the you know what kind of what's connecting with people. But um, that I think is the end of the presentation. We have books available at a 20% discount at the end. But now we have a Q and A. So I'd ask all the presenters to just come to the front. Some of us work for organisations that really do have well-developed core belief systems, okay. endorsed over many decades and years by behaviours driving type of results that were desired by reinforcing models such as that, but it doesn't necessarily um, speak to the right type of behaviours or the behaviours that have been talked about in your books and stuff like that. So when you've got that kind of hardwired culture endorsed and and justified every year, every month and every mid-month when the behaviour is to hit the budget and hit the KPI and that's reinforced on every day and every other day when you're chased to be able to... And those things are so embedded and you're just trying to, I suppose, come back from sessions like this where you bring a different type of thinking to a group of people that are looking for a different type of thinking because their core beliefs and systems have been reinforced over the years in certain ways. One question, but strategies for people who have to get up in the morning to <laughs> think, well, okay, Ella, what kind of angle am I going to approach today? And who do I need to speak to? What kind of approach should I deploy? Because it, often the environment where you're in is a the environment that you're stuck with, unless you want to move to a different organisation, which you may not have the opportunity to do. Exactly. Yeah, I want to go for that. For for me, certainly from experience dealing with, you know, and I get that you've got you know general managers that are just so focused on performance outcomes, and you can't cut through that kind of mindsets and behaviours. Is, is is what I used to do and I still do is try and find one at least advocate. If you can get one advocate, and then start right, let's let's. Like we've got this really cool, we want our leaders to all think this way and act this way. Cut one off, cut one off from the herd all that. Exactly. If you can cut one off from the herd, that's and then make that as a test case. And then they, they, the general managers generally are competitive beasts. So they will start to see over time they'll start to see performance in, improve. Uh, and the, the biggest leading indicator for me is unplanned sick leave, right? Because when you start to see your unplanned sick leave start to come down, then it creates more capacity for the systems to manage the system in behind. So when you start to see that, you start to see the performance and start to trickle thereafter. Um, and then when you start to get that, it's then how do you actually support and celebrate that? Um, so again, it's that reward and recognition piece and you're shouting from the top, so going, yes, this GM is driving, because trust me, they will start to, in fact, I had a, I had a lunch, sorry, a coffee uh, session I was telling the guys earlier with uh, a lady who I'd be mentoring, uh, runs uh, Aware Super's Customer Connect uh, centers. And she's been asked to come in a bit like this. She, she was my uh, cut off from the, the herd. Uh, she's been asked by our executive leadership team to come in and explain why her performance is out, outperforming all her peers. And her exact answer was because she's embedded um, the things and the thinking and mindsets and behaviors that I've talked about in the book. So she's one that is now going to influence the executive team, hopefully. And hopefully the executive team then will start to go, right, we need to change our, our leadership behaviors and mindsets. That's my own personal experience. Yeah, that's, a, that's a good one. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, it's a good, really good times because you know, we see it a lot where organizations are making a lot of money. So why do I need to change? And um, we'll answer back is, well, if you're making a lot of money now, the way, you, the way you're talking, imagine how much you could make. If you know. I'm glad you said that because it was able to cut one off from the herd uh, and within three months we were able to reduce spoilage in one area of one small plant in the division, um, because we made it visual, we were able to reduce the, the cost of a really decent Ferrari per month for one division where previously it was just a line item on, on a PL sheet. So, getting, getting advocates mm. on side, it's you'd absolutely a strategy that mm. worked for a while, but you need to back it up mm. and then advertise the fact that there's a cause and effect from these behaviours. These outcomes, 
why has everybody else jumping on board? It might be things that are not necessarily focused on as measures in visible. So Steve mentioned sick, sickness rates, absenteeism. It might also be employee turnover. So we see things that actually cost us a lot of money, which we yeah. don't necessarily manage, dramatically improve when we behave in these ways. So one of the reasons people don't necessarily connect is because they're not measuring the indicators that tell them all the benefits. I think one of the key tactics I'm using at the moment with customers is I look to understand the core belief system of the senior leaders first. So any company I work with, I look to try and engage the CEO if I can, if not one of his or her team. And then I set up a forum where I basically go around all of them and understand their core belief system, which through it, I'm starting to understand their purpose and drives in life and work. And I'm understanding their the current value system of that team. And I also do I also do, do a high level enterprise excellence review with them too, because they're typically they're driven people. So you start to bring the measures in and link it to the stats that come out of the Shingo Institute. I find that they can start to go, oh, I want that. But I can then adapt the story that I tell and the engagement I do to in a way that aligns with their core belief system. So by me adapting my language and how I engage them based on knowing their core belief system, I typically, I don't miss. I only have the odd failure because I'm basically understanding it. And then the way that I'm showing up to talk to them, it's basically bolt on. <clears throat> because I think most people's core belief system, if you look at the essence of values of people, I think there's some commonality amongst Australia at least in Australia, there's some basis of commonality. But really understanding it and getting them to verbalise it through the right questions, I think just sets you up to then be able to hit the home run with the way that you tell a story. And then I find the next position then is, what well, I'll hand over to you, Chris, by reading the look, listen, learn approach is massive then. Because I think that just opens their eyes. So we, we, we have a whole chapter on, on look, listen, learn and book, and um, you know, we encourage leaders to, to go and... and learn and I think one of the things that's often missed is we're not going to check up on the people when we do this we're actually going to check up on ourselves right? so we, we, we talk to people and ask them questions what we're trying to ask them to understand is am I helping you to do a good job is the system I'm giving you looking to help to, to make it easy for you to do a good job right? uh, we're not saying have you signed the form in the way you should have signed it you know, so is it it's about, no, it's about what do, I call it the look in the mirror questions. It's about talking to our people and understanding ourselves in terms of what have I got to do better to help these people more. And that's what it really gets to. That's when you really start. You have to be vulnerable and leave with humility. That was a big trigger for Signet was when I went out and did the Shingo Discover Excellence course with Chris out at Orica Halliden. And Peter Blanche and I, we paid our own way in there because the business wouldn't pay for us. And um, I think we did end up getting to pay for it actually in the end. But it was just amazing going and talking to those frontline crew at Orica. And, you know, the questions that we got to tailor through your coaching, Chris. But then when we went and sat with frontline crews and asked these questions, it was just like, yeah, you just, you had, your, your beliefs started to alter. And then we did that back at Signet. And um, and Signia, and it just it did great results. See, no one no one comes to work to deliberately do a bad job. So our, our role as leaders is to help them to do a great job because they want to do. That. So if people aren't doing a good job, we've got to ask ourselves: well, what is it we've got to change to help them to do a great job? Please, um, how often have you found that an individual or team's purpose is so far disconnected from the organisation's purpose? And what do you do in that sort of situation? Yeah, so uh, uh, quite a few recent examples, because um, I'm in BHP coaching, coaching them on their BHP operating system journey, which is essentially the Shingo model, the BHP five in language. Um, and yeah, a number of a number of, of their teams or crews on the front line that just had no connection to the overall BHP purpose of so that connection piece was completely missing. They, they couldn't connect on what they were doing each day to actually have that translated to the overall strategy of the organization. So in areas like that, and you, you sometimes also get individuals that have competing um, purposes. And there's a talent matrix uh, in the book, a tool, um, that will help, help you through that because sometimes, I'll talk about the crew in a second, but 
if you have an individual where the purpose is not aligned to the organization's purpose, you need to wear your coach hat because you need to coach them out of the organization, if that makes sense, or coach them to find a role or an organization that fulfills their purpose or meets their purpose. And when you do that, and it's not too often you get this, I think I've only had about two or three in my career, you will actually get them to, you know, meet what they're what they're supposed to do and they will thank you for it in the end. But back to the crew was a simple thing of, of well, how do we actually get that connection and that ocean cannery alignment, right? That vertical slice. So we I just literally got them got them in a room and go, what do your customers value from you? What does your up and downstream customers want from you? First of all, have, who are your customers? A lot of them didn't know who their up and downstream customers were. They were like so focused in on doing their jobs that they just had no clue of the value chain. So the first thing was, you know, who are your customers? What do they value? Right? And then the, the, all these post-it notes came up. And then we came up with simple three key um, words. Um, I can't remember the exact, it was one of the maintenance crews, but um, it was a safe, reliable service without compromising on quality. It was the safe, reliable, quality were the three key words that the team came up with. Right, so then the three key words were the key measures on the visual management board, safety, quality, and reliability. So every day they knew when they came in, were they meeting their safety? Uh, did we have a safe day? Yes, if not, why not? What are we gonna do about it? <coughs> are our metrics aligned to that? Hazard identification, you'll see this quite a lot, is a lagging metric, right? But the key behavior we should be there is the key KBI should be our cycle time to close hazards, right? Or something to prevent the hazards happening in the first place, but yet we're metricating people on hazards identification. Sure. Of course, what happens at the end of the month? Hazard, they create hazards just to fulfill the metric. Yeah. But anyway, I, I could talk so, about this. So I think Sorry. it's a really, really great question. Um, occasionally, people don't, you, you might have people who've got an issue, but you don't know why, and they don't know why. But when you sit down and you go through the purpose exercise, you, it's become really clear that that's, that's, there's a big disconnect. Great, great if you if you can coach them, if you can help them see it in a minute, I think just mentioning the cleaner. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but when you can't, you, you you have to support them to say, okay, well, this is not going to work for either of us. Because there's a big, there's too big a disconnect. And it'll impact not just them, but all their colleagues and the business. So it's not in their interest and not in your interest if the people that carry on struggling when there's a massive disconnect in personal purpose and company. Yeah, just Chris mentioned the cleaner, and it just brings me back to I was doing a session with um, the Calgary uh, Nickel West team, uh, and that Calgary is a furnace that um, takes the nickel and you know increases the quality of what goes off to the refinery. But I was doing a session a bit like this, a bit, bit big room like this, um, and there was probably about twenty or thirty people in the room, and I had the NPI team, which is the, the cleaners and the people that keep the, the site uh, clean and tidy. And one of the cleaners is, well, I'm just a cleaner. And I, I just stopped the presentation. I went, whoa, 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 back it up a bit there. You are not just a cleaner. And she was like, what do you mean I'm not? I said, you put 30% of the world's electric vehicles in the road. She says, what do you mean by that? I said, well, if you don't keep this site clean and tidy, the regulator will come, come in and shut the furnace down. Therefore, we can't produce enough nickel that goes in car batteries, nickel sulfate, goes in car batteries which supply Toyota and Tesla. All of a sudden, that connection to that purpose, that NPI team sang their customer value proposition every morning thereafter. And the amount of concern strips that they were finding on site, because they were in every nooks and cranny of the whole site, the amount of concern strips just was like incredible because they felt connected. Yeah. To it. Like the, you know, John F. Kennedy. And, uh, mm. but it wasn't, so it wasn't the fact that they, they couldn't be connected to us, but no one had helped them to see that connection. And I think that's, that's part of the Inspire Hat, is you know, we have to help people to understand and see that connection, and it has a yeah. massive impact. So, that, so off the back of that then, the other GMs started to go, well, every ton of dirt that we dig out of the ground is X number of car batteries, and they visualized it. So the people on the front line driving the trucks knew that, oh, that's another car battery. Yep. It was just that connection. And they, then they gamified it, right? So. Systems, and there's a graphic in the book which, which Chris and I were struggling to find a graphic that we couldn't find it in any literature around how do you connect the systems. So there's one in the book that we created. And if you're looking for a continuous improvement culture, system, working on your continuous improvement system, you need to also work on your supporting systems like your reward and recognition. 
vitally important. If that's not there, it won't happen. Your strategy deployment system. Are we are we make are we continue are we creating a culture of continuous improvement that's aligned to our true north and strategy? Our people system, are we are we training our people with the right tools and techniques and ability to do their jobs effectively? What else was in there? The health and safety, are we keeping them safe? They're all linked. You've got to work them all in one. Learning and development. Learning and development, yeah. Yeah. Fantastic presentation, guys. Um, what resonated with me strongly was what you were saying, Steve, about um, character and how you were recruiting for character, perhaps a little bit of the expense of uh, skill, and you're prepared to teach on the skill. Yeah. I'm interested, what, does the book talk to the types of characters and maybe the priority of, of the character attributes that you've look, looked at in terms of bringing people into the field? So it, it, it talks, the case study on that talks a bit about that, the how, but not necessarily into the details of the character. But the system around that was the um, was our recruitment system. We needed to fundamentally shift. So what that involved was we used to take in around forty new individuals, forty colleagues in each month. And so we have an assessment. Uh, we so we created an assessment center, and what that would be was um, the forty individuals would do tasks, right? And the leaders, and we even got frontline people into those assessment centers to assess their peers coming in. And we, we coined it, I want that person on my team, right? So they were in the room as well, selecting their peers, going, we were looking out for people who are, you know, going to have each other's back. We, we created games around this to identify, and you always get the loud one going, oh, I'm this, I'm not that, and I'm doing this, and they were, they were, the, they were the ones that we deleted straight away. <laughs> it, was the, it was the quieter ones who were, who were willing to work as a team, and we created kind of a plan around that. Um, and then the assessment centre also involved interviews, and... Uh, interviews with team leaders and with our peers. So it was a full day session. Um, but yeah, that, that was the system we created to do that. Um, well, remember I was saying to you, the, the leader's time on the systems of, of work was so high around the managing performance. When that started to reduce, obviously our onboarding system needed to change at the same time because we were recruiting people with no technical ability. So how do we actually refine our onboarding system to hit the ground running? So we actually refined it so well. It was eight, eight weeks eight weeks to take your first call, down to two weeks to take your first call. People learn by doing. So we actually got them on the phones a lot faster, but we created a system around coaching and development, live coaching in the moment, because people learn a lot faster. So the classroom, eight-week eight classroom, went down to two weeks live on the phones. In fact, in the first week, they started taking calls as a practice. So our, our onboarding system, again, practice systems all integrated, all have to work together. Um, but, but so just the, 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 the I think it was the average of 45% on the systems of work. That went down to 3%, right? And that time was reinvested into the system of developing our people. And that's when, because 30% of people leave the mining industry, for argument's sake, because of ineffective dev planning. So if you can actually create a really strong development system, and as we talked about a bit in the book, you will start to create that energy. And people, because people come to work each day to be, Part of something bigger than themselves. They want to be connected. They want to be developed. So. Sorry, a bit, bit of a long one. But I think isn't, isn't uh, uh, more detailed case study on that that we did for why bother? There is. Yeah, yeah. it's in my so in, in, yeah. in an earlier book, why bother? That there's a very detailed case study on that whole recruitment for behaviour yeah. system. Um, but yeah, that's fantastic. So a lot of that resonates, and yeah, can't wait to actually get more into it. But everything from the that recruiting part as well. The company I'm part of has had those challenges as well. Yeah. And getting people on seats, I guess, and that really folks around that. So um, through the directing, and we actually wish a couple of weeks ago, kind of, before our last leadership meeting, because we had our conversation around how do we make these our leadership team more effective and make more out of it. And that one around focusing on the culture, that's something we're definitely going to take back mm -hmm. from this as well. Um, got a couple of questions. That's right. But I can come next to the second one after. <laughs> but one is, um, have you kind of with um, someone, Jim, another company that's like a really big. Kind of national company, and just if you've got any thing you found has worked really well from like for, for really embracing these concepts, and uh, I guess the time as well part of it, of being able to focus on, on um, developing process and everything else, but anything around the kind of structural things you put in place first to be able to support leaders and put this together. And, I think where it worked well for me previously was defining the behavior. So, first of all, 
where are we going as an organization? What's our compelling vision, our true north, north star, aspirational, right? Um, and then go, right, in order to get there, what are the ideal behaviors? What are the current behaviors we have? And are they aligned? If not, we need to change it. What are the behaviors we need at every single level of this organization to, that's going to get us there? Um, and I, I, think, I think it's in the book as a case study, but we, we a similar, similar scenario where we, we got rid of the old behaviors. And it's almost like we had a burning ceremony, like symbolic. Um, and we created a, I got them all to sign, because I did the James Fair legacy, gave them all a book, all the leaders, and I said, read that. And that's how we have a session on behaviors. And we did that, we got them all to create their new behaviors, and they signed their rugby balls, of the behaviors that they want, and it was a symbolic thing. That then created that kind of platform for the organization then to, to, to develop. And then we started to work on the systems to support that. So how are we going to drive that behavior? So a sim simple system is and a complex centers of production environments. Uh, an example was I went to one BHP general manager said, I want every, what, what, would it, what would you say to me if I said, I want every single on your, every single person on your site off the, off the tools doing improvements for 90 minutes a week? I got a few expedients back. <laughs> But if that's the behavior you want, you want you know a thousand people, problem solvers every day, everywhere, everybody solving problems of one percent improvement, easier, better, faster, cheaper. You want that every single day. What is the behaviors we're going to have to? What's the system going to do that? So we created a simple champion improvement system or quality. I think Toyota is it Toyota quality circles. Yeah, similar yeah. quality yeah. circles. Yeah. One person comes off the team each week to do problem solving. So you get all your team members together problem solving and then you work on that cross team collaboration you work on those problems you start to release capacity they do that for three months every week 90 minutes or whatever that number is and you start to release this capacity that person goes back into your team crew and another person comes in so over time you start to create a system of everybody every day everywhere solving problems Each system is trying to struggle it. often when you say what are what are the ideal behaviors we need and we get kind of what do you mean what do you like so uh, what we've found is that there's a slightly different lens you say okay what behaviors do we need in our frontline people in order to really achieve that mm -hmm. goal and if that's the behaviors we need in our frontline how have i got to behave to help them mm -hmm. to behave like that so what's my behavior purpose of my behaviors is to encourage and support that behavior and then it's much easier to say, okay, what does that mean? What does that mean? Which is what I got to do. It's doing those sort of reviews that Chris mentioned that where the hats have largely come from. Because as you do this hundreds of times, you start to see common themes and leadership behavior to so get that outcome. But I'm finding if you're if you're leading this out from the top, like exactly, but getting clear on the behaviors, but then the one system you can lean into, I think that can start two systems that can really start punching it from the top is strategy and behavioral planning, deployment, execution. Get the, I call it like the drumbeat, getting that cadence connected from front line to top. And then the other bit is your leadership program. That's linked to culture. I'm, you know, And when I say leadership, it's right from onboarding. Doug's right, so I think your case study, talking about drawing leaders from inside the company then, even they're not a leader yet, but we're gonna start them on this program for the future. And to me, if you wanna lean in on two processes or two systems to really get going, then feedback guys I think they're two really good ones oh, that can start perfect. to move you forward absolutely yeah and they're ones that the senior leadership own you know who, who can make those happen or not it's senior leadership and even the board they can get involved Ooh. that's rock and fuel because then you've got the board supporting the senior leadership to stay focused on making getting that going I do find with some customers the board can cause carnage so I've got customers where the board is on board and they're part of it and then I got customers where the CEO is playing like that gatekeeper between the board. But the thing that helps that CEO control the board is their strategic plan and having a good execution system. Because you find that most boards, if they're competent, you can say to them, this is what we're working on, this is what we're doing. And the board's trying to, because you've got now advisors on boards. So you've got these people on boards pushing all these ideas down. But if the CEO's got a very good execution system and a very good cultural system, he or she can go, okay, board, you want that done? Let's look at what we're working on. Is what you're saying more important than this? And that is a way that the CEO can control the board. Because often the board is totally disconnected from the front line. <coughs> I find that some companies can drive absolute chaos because 
the board has a bunch of experts on there trying to push a whole lot of stuff down that's really but again that's where those two systems can help control the board and, and connect the two I should say so I think we're against yes. we haven't heard from yourself well, because uh, I've been absorbing all this stuff, I have to take it back to the shop and put it into play. I think a lot of what you guys are sharing as a practitioner resonates. And I think the way I'm sort of boiling it down to is our job as a leader is to create the conditions where an individual finds their own reason to be part of something bigger. Um, and how do we support that? Also, how do we frame that so that they're not going off on their own path? But, you know, I don't go to work for my boss. I go to work for me. And it's really creating those conditions for that person to understand that and, and feel like they're part of something, but then also collaborate, right? Yeah. So the purpose, uh, it gives me confidence, the purpose we created for our operations group is become more capable and productive individuals working better as one team with one goal that's to it. protect our future. Yeah. You know, and, and I think that's what I've heard is the questions, what are we wrestling with? Mm -hmm. I hear systems in it, but if we can create that purpose yep. mm -hmm. reason. Purpose individual within a team because mm -hmm. we, we, we are actually generally we are social people yeah mm -hmm. so so we, so we need that connectivity with the team in order to help us realize our own great great way of putting it right boris welcome glad you could make it thank you good to see you again thank this you. great presentation thank you from all of the presenters um so my question is especially when it comes to larger organizations that might be uh you know taking on this journey of operational excellence, uh, and especially you mentioned the board. So they're very results driven, they're looking at the KPIs and they're looking at the bottom line. When you're doing some sort of a continuous improvement transformation, uh, you might see instant results, but what's missing is, I guess, the sustainability in the long term. Um, changing culture, building habits takes a long time, but then what you won't see immediately is the results. How do you sort of balance the two and, I guess, keep the uh, you know, say board of the senior management uh, patient and understanding that this will work, but it's not going to move the dial as quickly as you think that it will hope that it will. Uh, one thing just sort of board a bit. Yeah. So definitely those two bits I've already mentioned with the boards, where we involve the board and get alignment on strategy and what we're going to do with execution. So they play a massive part in that system. And then also we line them up with our culture and all them like the Matthews way. And this is a leadership development program and how we're going to build and grow great leaders. But then the other thing I'd hand on is getting the board to do look, listen, learn walks, not constantly, but at intervals, which I'll hand over to Chris because I know you talk on this, but boards typically stay in the boardroom, but they don't get to see and learn. And I think the look, listen, learn work walks are bringing that into play. Yeah, definitely. That's a really powerful tool. And I think also... Um, question what we're measuring, you know, how are they measuring success? Mm -hmm. There's a whole bunch of hidden costs in, in, in the employee side of uh, people leaving, having to recruit, people going sick, and all that kind of absenteeism. That I prefer, you know, don't measure absenteeism, measure attendance because it's much more positive. So, everything focus our metrics on, on positive numbers. Um, and when they see that whole picture, says, yeah, yeah, okay, I'm, you're chasing that one KPI up here. But that one KPI gives us a fraction of what we really need to know if we want to deliver a successful, sustainable business. What are all the things that, because you, you you will actually see some things changing very quickly. You just might not measure them yet. But, uh, so the the way that improvement works is um, the first things that's visible is actually the way people behave and things start looking differently. Uh, it can then take some a period of time before that impacts on the operational metrics. And then it takes even longer before it impacts on the financial metrics. And maybe just people need to understand that says there's a there's a sequence to this. There's a lag measure to the financial impact. But we're on the what we're looking at is the lead indicators when we look at the behavior that we know will give us that result further down the line. Anyone one last question. Yeah? All right. I, I had a question, yeah. yeah. Well, you're, you go first. Uh, <laughs> two last questions. No, no, you. No, you go. Okay. Um, around purpose, um, uh, obviously a very central concept that's been spoken a lot about today, uh, and a lot of the other concepts sort of cascade underneath purpose. Is it something that you see as set in stone for a business or an organisation? And if not, when is the right time to view the Great question. Uh, no. 
<laughs> what do you think? Can evolve. They evolve. As, as even evolves in us. Yeah. The social and all the extrinsic, intrinsic forces. Mm. Yeah. yeah, look, a uh, recent example is one of the, the BHP assets. Uh, when, I, when I came in to work with the leadership team, they had no vision, they had no purpose. So I was like, how do you connect your people? What do you mean? So I had a purpose session with them, similar to what's in the book, and I was, I was like, whoa, they didn't even have their own purposes, let alone create the organization's purpose. So that was the first thing we did. And then all of a sudden then we had a North Star, we had a clear purpose, and then right, what's a communication system and reward and recognition system that's going to support the enablement of our people rolling towards that North Star? And then all of a sudden then it started to evolve. People started to connect. You don't want to be yeah. changing it every week. No. But it will it will evolve. We, you know, to the book world we're in now, things will impact us that we had no idea were going to happen. We might need to look at what does that, what's, what does that mean for us? You know, so, and I, I mean, I, I now have a, a very different purpose at this stage in my life than I had ten years ago. Mm-hmm. And so our personal purposes can evolve as well. Right. So I guess you would um, have had a, a sort of annual, maybe review of purpose, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. if you if you want to. Put it into a time frame, I guess. Uh, I would probably put it into uh, some somewhere where you can you do a check on a it. check, yeah, and say, you know, are we are we still is this the right place? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the right Yeah, the changing environment. It's really, 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 change it. really good point. I think I think the concept of plan, do, study, adjust, or plan, do, check, act. I think that applies to absolutely everything. And 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 same with purpose. Same. Let's just check. Is that right? Because you might think you landed on. And then bad eyes, not quite. Know, that's tweaky then. The purpose might be might be driving wrong behaviours. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that pause, reflect, and go, hang on a second, what are the behaviours are saying? Are we meeting our KPIs or are we performing to where we need to perform? If not, why not? And what's wrong? Why why aren't our people connecting? And that's that, you know, annual check is a good is a good way to end. Great question. Thank okay, you. Very good. Last one. I teach you commonly ask you. Uh, oh, I can only see half the panel. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, sit back! <laughs> Very interesting for me to hear Laurie Skander's name come up. Oh, you know, so, some 30 years ago, um, I worked in the HR Tech Fertilizer and Crop Protection in Brisbane. Yeah. And Laurie was a HR manager at the time I started, I moved into a management role. Um, so I'd really like to connect whoever of you is connected with Laurie um, to, yeah. to say good day. Yeah, I've got a but, but to go to my question, um, over that three decade period, we all know, you know if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Um, and I was reflecting on KBIs versus KPIs. We heard the word KPI through the last uh, 10 minutes or so. But you know, I suspect the answer will be, oh, you should buy the book because the, the case studies in the <laughs> book. But my question is, um, having a, a performance matrix around KBIs, what does that look like? Okay. Um, you need both, right? So you need a K, you need KBI to tell us, are we achieving what we intended to achieve? Right? But it shouldn't be the thing that we only look at because it's, it's like driving a car and only looking in the rear view mirror. So the, what a KBI is, is a lead indicator that tell us, tells us in advance how we want to get that. And KBIs are massive in terms of application. You do need to read the book because there are so many different ways of doing them. But um, for exa- I'll give you two or three very quick examples. Right? I won't talk about how much time we spend on a leadership team meeting talking about culture. That's a KBI. Because anything that measures behavior, in that case we're measuring the behavior of the leaders in terms of talking about people and culture. So, so we set an agenda, we said we're going to spend 50% of the agenda on people and culture, did we? Um, another, one, another one would be uh, people get hung up, especially engineers get hung up on trying to turn KBIs into KPIs in terms of I've got to have graphs and charts and measures in this day. Okay. Quite a lot of behaviors you can't do that. You have to be come back and treat it as an indicator and you say, is it red or green? Mm. So a team at the end of a team meeting, they've agreed the behaviours of how they'll agree, how they'll behave in that meeting. They have a 
two, three minute at the end of the session and says, how do we do against our agreed behaviors in that meeting? Is it red or green? And, if, you know, and in both cases, what's really important, they explain with an example. You know? It's green because Brad did this, or it's red because Chris did that. You know? And that, so that you, by talking about behaviors, you get better for them. That, that, that's the exact system I implemented in a recent executive team meeting. Um, and I wanted them to also develop on their vulnerability and humility because they're not very smart individuals, but just very kind of high IQ, lower EQ. Exact same system, Kamish Abide Board at the end of the meeting, went around the table, did 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 you meet those behaviors we agreed? And they would say, and most of the time it was red. They felt that they didn't contribute as well as they should have contributed. And over time, we started to move them. But that, did, that, that helped with that vulnerability and humility at the same just time. You, you could do something simple. simple system. System. But the best I've seen is uh, Signet Sync Factory, a team of 10 people. Frontline crew came up with it, not leadership. And on their huddle board, they have a section where they put up two or three behaviors at any one time, and they lead it. And man, they debate it. <laughs> you know, before they put that red or green, they're challenging each other. I think we live it. And yeah. I think the thing that's, Chris said something to me once that just hit home. He said, yeah, Brad, systems are important, but you can have a system, but if you don't know the behaviors that you're really focused on to make sure the system's working and you're not looking at the system to make sure that the system or the process is actually, in, you know, because they're interchangeably, you know, it's like the, your thoughts and your feelings, they impact each other. And that really just hit home to me when Chris said that. I was like, that is it. And the Signet Ink Factory, they do that without knowing it because they're, they're choosing behaviours based on systems that have failed or things that have happened, like particularly around safety or around quality. And then then defining simple behaviours, like one would be, did we pick up all the marbles off the floor yesterday every time we saw a marble because they make aerosol paint? And it's a major safety hazard if you hit a marble. You could kill yourself. You could, like, slip. And they'll track red or green. And then once they see green for, like, I think, what was it, like six weeks, eight weeks, ten weeks? Andy and I worked with them. Um, yeah, they'll rub it off. They formed a habit. That's the key with KBIs. They might only be in place for a very small amount of time because you've, you've embedded that behaviour. Yeah. yeah. Great, get rid of it. Measure something down the set. Don't just keep measuring. Don't you? Last last one, last thing I'm for, because this isn't in the book. But, um, you can have fun with them too. You make them fun. You empower your people. Take those constraints off and let, uh, uh, free, create that freedom where people can have a go at stuff where they connect with. So I was up in the Pilbara and the team had put the uh, visual management board in and set up a, a challenge ourselves to do our meetings in 15 minutes. I went to do an assessment. Next to the board uh, is the name of everyone in the team. And some of these names have got crosses against them. So I'm like, what, what's this? So, oh, well, we started these meetings. And everyone was pitching up late, you know, it's meant to be 15 minutes, no one was disciplined in terms of coming here on time and so So we agreed as a team, no manager involved at all, we agreed as a team that if someone's late to the meeting, we get a cross against the name. If they're late three times, they have to buy everyone in the team a cake. There's three names on this list with three crosses against them. I said, what's going on? So, said, well, three people have to buy cakes, no one's late for a meeting now. And we, we don't use it anymore, but we just left it up to show you because you were coming. Mm. <laughs> but that, you know, that's the power of them. You empower the teams to say, okay, guys, if that's what behavior you want in your team, how are you going to hold yourselves accountable for it? Mm. Simple but beautiful. Thank you. Great yeah. questions from everybody. Really enjoyed that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, Brando, of course,